the small seaside resort of Yalta in Russia at the turn of the century. The great dramatist Anton Chekhov is staying there and pondering his next play. There are moments when an overwhelming desire comes over me to write a four-act farce or comedy for the art theatre. The next play I write will definitely be funny, very funny, at least in intention. It hasn't turned out as a drama, but as a comedy, in places even a farce, and I'm afraid I might get into hot water with the management. Stanislavski has a big part. The last act will be very gay, and the whole play is gay and light-hearted. They may not like you. They'll say I'm no longer profound. So far, so good. Chekhov finished his four-act comedy and sent it to his long-term collaborator, the actor-manager Stanislavski, at the Moscow Art Theatre. And Stanislavski wrote back, Dear Anton Pavlovich, in my opinion, your Cherry Orchard is your best play. I've fallen in love with it even more deeply than with our dear Seagull. I wept like a woman. I tried to control myself, but I could not. I hear you say, but please, this is a farce. No, for the ordinary person, this is a tragedy. The Moscow Art Theatre, 1904. The first performance of The Cherry Orchard. Afterwards, Chekhov wrote, Some friends saw The Cherry Orchard in March. Both of them say that Stanislavski is playing abominably in Act 4 and dragging things out most painfully. All I can say is Stanislavski has ruined my play. Oh, well, the less said about him, the better. The latest production of The Cherry Orchard, the Riverside Studios in Hammersmith, London. I'm tired. I must sit down for a while. I just heard a man in the kitchen say that the orchard has been sold. So, who has bought it? He didn't say. He's gone now. It was just some old man. He didn't know what he was talking about. It was a stranger. He's gone now, anyway. And where's Larry Dandrevich, eh? Still not back. And he's only wearing his light overcoat. But he could catch a cold, though. These young people. I'm dying. Yasha, go and find out who has bought it. <laughs> the old man went ages ago. What are you laughing about? What's so funny? Peter Gill, director and adapter of the Riverside production. Did Stanislavski really make a botch of that first performance by refusing to play it for laughs? Well, I think that it's far too easy to, um, to make a case out against Stanislavski. I find it a very difficult play to do now. How I would have done it had it been 1904, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it's very easy to make those kind of knocks. I think it's also, um, I mean, so I can't really feel anything but um, profound sympathy for Stanislavski because uh, it's a, a difficult piece. I mean, I understand that he might have got it wrong, but I'm, um, I wouldn't like to do the first production. It is a comedy in the very classic sense. It is not a tragedy. And farcical things occur and amusing things occur. It varies in tone because he's a writer who has a particularly idiosyncratic and brilliant comic genius. Okay, Philip. Oh, nature, glorious nature, full of never ending light. So beautiful and yet so cold and remote. Mother, in whom life and death are united. Creator and destroyer. Uncle dear, you're starting again, Uncle dear. The plot seems simple enough on the face of it. A low-key drama where the sale of the family cherry orchard becomes the catalyst for an examination of character and relationships and for the imaging of a society in transition. What was that? Oh. Sounded like a cable snapping in a mine. Must have been a long way off. That. Could have been a bird. A heron, perhaps. Or an owl. So what's so complicated about it? And why was the first major production in England in 1925 greeted with such bewilderment? John Gielgud was in it. When we did the Cherry Orchard the first time in the, in the 20s, it was so unsuccessful, so, so controversial, rather, 
that the, the, the management printed a poster with uh, on one side Agit saying everybody must see this play and on the other Basil MacDonald Hastings was quite a well-known novelist I think saying this is the most idiotic play in London and they were put up together and in the, slowly slowly the public began to take to it I mean people used to walk out but uh, not very many of them and more and more and then after the next time when in the 30s it was sort of accept they were accepted as a, as a fait accompli. It's now so firmly established as one of the great comic or tragic masterpieces of the century that it doesn't seem too surprising that yet another new production is due to open in London in two weeks' time. It's at the National Theatre, and Michael Frayne did the translation. The reason the Cherry Orchard in particular survives almost anything that anybody can do to it is that it's a very strong drama. I think this aspect has been very underemphasized in the past. People have tend to see, tended to focus on the surface of the play um, and uh, looked at its poetry, um, its uh, the quirks of character, the eccentricities of Russian behavior and so forth. But the central situation of a, a family gradually being squeezed out of its hole on its own home, partly by uh, tremendously powerful social pressures and partly by their weaknesses, complementary weaknesses inside themselves, is a, is a very strong one. The central character of the play is the owner of the cherry orchard, Madame Ranovskaya. Chekhov's wife took the part in 1904. In the Riverside production, Ranovskaya is played by Judy Parfit. I was born in this house, you know. This is where my mother and father lived and my grandfather. I love this house. I can't conceive of my life without the cherry orchard. If they're going to sell it, then let them sell me with it. This is where my son was drowned. Oh, Pietro. Have some mercy, my dear, kind friend. You know I sympathize with you with all my heart. But you must say it differently. <laughs> differently. Oh, you can't imagine how depressed I am. Oh, it's so noisy. Every sound makes my soul shudder. I'm shaking with it. But I'm afraid to go to my room. I'm afraid of being alone. We think of the cherry orchard as a kind of, uh, as it might be, a forsterian image. Uh, you know, that uh, a house is the English style with a small orchard at the bottom. Whereas, in fact, I think the orchard is... is um, is a thousand acres, which is bigger than Hyde Park, I think. Um, so that we're dealing with... Uh, that's why doing it at Riverside Studios is quite interesting, because the width of the space that we're working on here is 73 feet. So that you... that, with all the pro attendant problems of doing a play which has got domestic detail, um, makes the director and the actors work in width, which is... Um, which is a, if you like, a Russian quality. How big is it? It's a thousand acres. Must be. Mm. 25,000 rubles a year. And if you advertise it for 25 rubles. Oh, no, that's very marvellous. How marvellous. It is to have brains. I never thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> Ranovskaya is the fulcrum of the play. The action revolves around her. She's the mother of the household, almost the adopted mother of all the other characters. Where has Lenny got to? I can't understand it. It must be all over by now, surely. Either the estate's been sold or the auction never took place. It really is too bad of him. Why is he keeping us in the dark like this? Uncle has bought it, I'm sure of it. Oh, has he? Our great aunt sent him power of attorney to buy the estate in her name. So that the mortgage can be transferred to her. She did it for me. Uncle has bought the estate. I'm sure he has. Our great aunt doesn't trust us, you see. She sent us 15,000 rubles. Not enough to pay off the interest. They're deciding my fate today. My fate. Madame Le Parkina. The eternal student. You've been sent down. Why? Sorry, dear. Don't. Julie Covington plays Ranovskaya's adopted daughter, Varia, who's been waiting two years for an offer of marriage from a diffident suitor. Mama, I can't joke about it. I'm not like that. To me, it's a serious matter. And he's a nice man. I like him. <laughs> then what are you waiting for? Marry him, why don't you? I don't understand it. 
Mama, he hasn't asked me. I can hardly propose to him myself, can I? For nearly two years now, everyone has been talking about this marriage except him. He either ignores me or makes fun of me. What you've got to, to do is you've got to feel this conversation between the two of you a bit like that, in a way, as you are now. Both the daughters of the family have suitors. Both are prevented from marrying in some way by their relationship with their mother. The younger sister, Anya, played by Caroline Langrish, has just returned from a trip to Paris where she had to retrieve her mother from a hopeless love affair. Without being um, unrealistic, it's got to be very vivid what mm. happened in Paris because not only do we have to know what happened mm -hmm. in Paris to your mother for the general story, but we obviously have to know what it has done to you. I can't imagine what it's been like. I can. I left in Holy Week. It's still snowing. That's right. Good. Now, sorry, didn't know, but, but start there. You've got to tell us when you left so that, so that we... You've got this very difficult job here, I think, which is that you, you left when? In Holy Week. Yes, that's right. So you've got to tell her the story of what happened. And with the result that we get information, mm. right? And we also learn something about you, but it, it can't be any other week but Holy Week, particularly since this audience were no being all pagans, right? Okay. I left in Holy Week. It was still snowing. Why did I have to take Charlotte? She never stopped talking. The difficulty of Act One is that it is all exposition. The job is to try and make it a believable scene. Paris was cold. It was snowing when we arrived. And Mama no. was living. You, very good, but you see, you left the story. Paris was cold. Pa what was Paris like? Cold. Yeah, it couldn't be anything else. That's all we want to know. Okay. Go from the same place. <coughs> I can't imagine what it's been like. I can. I left in Holy Week. It was still snowing. Why did I have to take Charlotte? She never stopped talking and doing those stupid conjuring tricks. You could hardly have gone by yourself, my darling. You're only 17. <laughs> Paris was cold. It was snowing when we arrived. No. But good. Paris was snowing. indeed cold that time. But what was it like when you arrived? Snowing. Exactly. It couldn't be anything else. But I have... Tell her the story. Think of telling her a story. Paris was cold. It was snowing when we arrived. And Mama was living in the most awful place, right up on the fifth floor. And my French is awful. She had visitors when we arrived. Some French ladies and an old priest with a book. The room was full of cigarette smoke. You can't imagine how untidy and pokey it was. I suddenly felt sorry for her. I suddenly felt sorry for her. And I took her head in my hand. And I couldn't let her go. She was so loving. And she cried all the time. Oh, I can't bear it. She'd sold her villainy a monton, and she had no money left. None at all. I only had enough to get to Paris with. But Mama has no idea about money. <laughs> On our way home, she'd order expensive meals in the station restaurant and tip the waiters a rouble each. <laughs> Charlotte was the same. And Yasha always expected the same treatment as everyone else. It was dreadful. How is everything here? The interest in paid yet? No, it hasn't. I knew it. Oh, God, what's going to happen? The estate's going to be sold oh. in August. <laughs> oh, I could. <laughs> Has he asked you yet, Varia? Why not? Right, so try and... That's right, that's a very good instant. Try and come and sit here and talk to her. Oh, God, what's going to happen? 
The estate's going to be sold in August. Sold? Oh, my God. Move! Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, he's... I'd like to... Has he asked you yet, Varia? Why not? Leparkin, the indecisive suitor, is played by Michael Elphick. Yes, I think she is. She wants him to ask her, ask her to marry him. He won't. Hmm. Why doesn't it work out? Well, I... Oh, I think he does, but he, I think it's because of the connection with, um, uh, Luba. I mean, he's... It'd be, it's almost like incest, if I was to go off with her. Yeah. So again, it's Luba, Ranivskaya, who dominates even the characters outside the family circle. I saw such a good play yesterday. It was really amusing. I'm sure it wasn't at all amusing. Instead of going to the theatre, you should all take a good look at yourself first. See what dreary lives you all lead. What a lot of nonsense you talk. Yes, you're quite right. I agree. We do live a ridiculous existence. My father was an old brute. Didn't know anything didn't teach me anything except to be frightened of him when he was drunk. I wasn't taught anything, so I don't know anything. My right is so bad, I'm afraid to let people see it. It's like a pig's. From the beginning, Leparkin had always been something of a problem. Chekhov had conceived him as a sympathetic character, and yet it is he, the acquisitive merchant, the speculator, whose fortune eventually enables him to buy the cherry orchard. Chekhov wanted Stanislavski to play him. Stanislavski looked down the cast list and picked another part, that of Gaev, the romantic, ineffectual brother of the family. In the current production, Gaev is played by Philip Locke. But did I tell you I've been offered a place in the bank? Six thousand a year. You? In a bank? I don't think so, my dear. Huh. <clears throat> Put this on. Oh, you're so boring. The character of a languorous, ineffectual aristocrat would have been a familiar one to the Russian audiences of the time. The only characteristic Chekhov prescribes for Gaev in the text is his obsession with billiards. Put, put your hand down right, that's right, Phil. Now, now take it. Yeah, but he's having a practice. Oh. It would be fair to say Philip Locke's technique needed a little polishing. Right, now, Philip, do that. Do it without the cue to see you can get... Right, just playing. He's in good company. John Gilgood had the same problem. Yeah, I was always getting these things to do that I couldn't do. I could never get the billiard strokes right because I never been able to play billiards. Into the center. A good break. Well, apparently Chekhov couldn't play billiards either. But oh, really? <laughs> he must have learned somebody who, who did that, who had that other kind of mannerism. Uh, do you know how old this bookcase is, Luba? Last week I took out the bottom drawer. And when I looked carefully, I found a date burned inside it. This bookcase was made exactly a hundred years ago. Imagine that. We could celebrate its centenary. <laughs> One of the most famous scenes from The Cherry Orchard, Gaev's address to the bookcase. This is from Gilgood's own adaptation of the play, performed at the Aldwych in 1961. Remarkable. Dear, deeply respected, Silent friend, I salute your existence which has for more than a hundred years inspired such shining ideals of goodness and justice. Your silent call to profitable study has never failed during all these hundred years to uphold during the succeeding generations of our family, courage, faith in a better future and a sense of the noble ideals of good behavior and social consciousness. Last year, the playwright Trevor Griffiths did a new adaptation of The Cherry Orchard for the Nottingham Playhouse. He gave it a very different emphasis from the versions that had been seen in England so far. The best part of 40 years we've been playing Cherry Orchards and Three Sisters and Vanyas that have been hopelessly sentimentalized. Um, moreover, we've been playing plays that have become the total possession of a particular sect inside the English theatre, um, which can be defined as upper middle class, um, 
interested in the life of the emotions exclusively um, with very little preoccupation with objective things like class interactions, class struggle, history as such. Um, and uh, I've always read Chekhov, in spite of what it, despite whatever translations come at me, I've always read Chekhov as very much more obsessed by those considerations than by the life of the emotions. The most overtly political character in the play is the student revolutionary Trofimov, a controversial figure for the Russian audiences of 1904. Today at Riverside, he's played by Stephen Ray. All of you, your whole family, from the first to the last, even you, Anya, you none of you, not your mother nor your uncle, nor even you, really know that you've incurred debt that you can never pay, that you're living at the expense of other people's happiness of other people's lives at the expense of people you won't let through the door. We are living out of our own time. We are living in the past. Two hundred years in the past. We have no sense of history because we have no history. We have no culture. We are stuck. So we just philosophize and suffer from neurotic depression and drink vodka. But before we can begin to live in the present, we must find some way to expiate the past. To finish with it, we must atone for it. And we will only finish with it through suffering and by a great and ceaseless struggle. It's important that you understand this, Anya. I'm sure Chekhov agrees with a lot of what Trofimov says about the, uh, about the condition of Russia. But all the same, Trofimov does fall into rhetoric. His big speeches do tend to disappear into a kind of utopian language, which Chekhov certainly couldn't possibly have endorsed himself. It was just alien to his nature. I don't think he's got anything very constructive to offer in terms of freedom for all the people that he talks about being enslaved, but he's very sensitive to a kind of feeling that must have been going on in Russia at that time, so he kind of he, he, he hooks into that, but he, he can't be actually more creative and more productive than just expressing that feeling. How do you put him in as a character in a comedy? Well, because he takes himself so seriously and condemns people who, who do take themselves seriously, that makes him comic, doesn't it? Why does he fancy Anya? Well, have you seen her? <laughs> Forward! We are marching towards that bright star there, shining in the distance. Forward! There's no going back, my friend. Bravo! That's one! Bravo! He is, to me, in the versions that come down to us, a, a distinctly unsatisfactory character. And it was part of my task in making this new version, to, my new version, to, to see how he could be made more satisfactory, more complete, more coherent. And I've given him, for that purpose, a more politicized language than I think even Chekhov could have aspired to had there not been a censorship. Chekhov knew more about politics than he knew about billiards, but not that much more. Um, and that's why he tends to, to go in the direction of rather rhetorical idealism for Trofimov. I don't think you can put any general political interpretation on it, because Chekhov makes it absolutely clear in his letters that he simply didn't see life in that kind of way, that he was not a liberal and not a conservative. Uh, and he didn't take sides. The, obviously, the central political balance of the play lies between Lapachin and Trofimov. I'm fond of you, you know. You have fine hands, like an artist. I think it's very clear, both from the ways the parts are written and from what he said about the characters in letters, that his, uh, he takes a very sympathetic view of both characters. Are you all right for money? Are you sure? Let me give you some for the journey. No, thanks. You haven't got a farthing. Yes, I have. I got some for translation. It's in here. Wish I could find my galoshes. Here are the wretched things. What's the matter? 
Listen, Gloria. Hey. These aren't my galoshes. And in the fourth act, he spends a lot of time looking for galoshes. Now, it's been held by critics that um, that indicates a kind of pettiness, a kind of smallness, a kind of narrowing down of the revolutionary focus. My view is that galoshes would have been enormously important to a person with no possessions at all. I sowed 3,000 acres of poppy in the spring. I made at least 40,000 profit. You should have seen those poppy fields in bloom. What a sight. Wonderful. So you see, I'm offering you a loan because I can afford it. I've just made 40,000. But don't turn your nose up at me, please. I don't mind talking about money. I'm a peasant. I speak as I find. Your father was a peasant, and my father was a chemist. What does that mean? Absolutely nothing. No, I don't want any money. Really, I don't. Don't you see that I wouldn't take 200,000? I have to be free of all that. I don't want it. Everything the rest of you want, the rich and the poor, possessions, money, all that, it's no more to me than dust blown in the wind. I don't need you, you see. I've passed you by. And I'm proud of it. And strong because of it. Again, it's the, the old story of the fact that political theatre is not really about people making political speeches, but rather about the whole structure of the play. And in this play, I would think, um, in, if anything, Leparkin is as important, and the relationship particularly between those characters, with, if you like, Ranievska as a fulcrum. But I think even that is too simple, because it's too, um, it's such an elaborate and complex uh, play structurally, and it is in that that the, uh, the political um, brilliance of the play lies. Oh, don't think badly of me, Pietro. I love you as if you were my own son, do you know that? And I'll willingly let Anya marry you. But my darling boy, first you must finish your studies. You really must, Pietro. You seem so unstable. You seem to be driven from one thing to another. Isn't that so? Isn't it? And why don't you do something about your beard? You are a funny boy. I have no interest in my looks. The telegrams from Paris. I get one every day. Yesterday, today, things are going badly with him. He's ill again. He writes for forgiveness and begs me to return to him. Perhaps I should. I don't know. Oh, you're so censorious, Pietro. Don't look at me like that. What else can I do? He's ill, he's lonely, he's unhappy. And who else is there to take care of him? To stop him from making a fool of himself? To see that he takes his medicine? And anyhow, I love him. Why should I deny it? Why should I? I love him. I do. It's like having a millstone round my neck, and no doubt I shall sink in the end. But I can't live without him. I can't. I won't. Oh. Don't think too badly of me, Pietro. Shh, don't speak, don't say me. But I must. Please, forgive me, but I must. He's destroying you. He's swindling you. I won't listen. He's a second-rate swindler, and you're the only one who won't admit it. He's nothing. How can you? He's worthless. How old are you? What? 26, 27, and you still talk like a schoolboy. What if I do? It's time you grew up talking like that at your age. You know nothing, nothing of what it feels like to be in love. You're a prude, a prig, a prank, a freak. What does she say? Above love. You're not above love. You're not capable of love. Why haven't you got a mistress? How old are you? This is terrible. I can't listen. I'm going. I'm going. It's all over between us. Oh, Pietro, come back, you silly boy. I didn't mean it. Pietro? Watch how Pietro has fallen. 
Run downstairs. Oh, what a strange boy he is. I can't imagine anyone now would overlook the, the comic aspects of the play, but they can be taken too far. You simply cannot read the Russian text and not be moved by it as well as amused. It really is a moving play as well as a funny one. And to find exactly the right line, the right balance between being moving and being comic is, is extremely difficult. If I were to do a production or to advise anybody doing a production of The Cherry Orchard, what to do first, I would say to start by teaching the actors to waltz. Uh, that's another example of the difference between England and Europe, the, the, um, the ability to waltz well is um, of the essence. There you are, my darling boy. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Shall we dance? Peter Gill's highly acclaimed production of The Cherry Orchard finishes its run at the Riverside Studios in Hammersmith on February the 5th, and the National Theatre production in a new translation by Michael Frayn opens on February the 14th.